My computer is a little slow, so I do apologize um, if there's anything, but it should be okay. So um, thank you very much for having me uh, today. I am so honored. I never imagined I'll have the honor of being uh, presenting to you. Um, but um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my experience of how it was to um, write a grant as not only as an economist PA, but as a very junior economist PA as well when I was uh, doing it. Um, I called it um, the NIHR is can be a new hope for the health economists and is I got a little bit of a Star Trek um, thing. I, I was on it uh, for some reason yesterday. So um, I, a long time ago in a program grant far, far away, uh, we're talking about 2009, and I had just moved to the UK, uh, having spent like eight years in America, and my experience of health economics was how to uh, price insurance. I had no idea what a quality was, and I, um, I had been in a, in a teaching uh, background, so I had no publications in health economics. I was a macroeconomist by background, and, um, and I was uh, given this opportunity of uh, changing my life, moving into health, and got uh, employed as the junior researcher doing economic evaluation alongside uh, lots of studies in this program grant, uh, feasibility studies, RCTs. But this would take a long time uh, for the actual economic data to arrive. Um, so to do that, uh, in the meanwhile, um, Ashley, the surgeon said, um, why don't you help Andy, the systematic reviewer, with um, their reviews? And I said, sure, let's, let's learn how to do one. And there was this systematic review about whether different bearing surfaces for hip implants uh, were going to be effective. And uh, we were struggling with that review, like what is effective? Is it revision rate? Is it a prom? Um, how long are we looking at them? We want to know if they are effective 10, 20 years down the line, but all the trials all finished at six months to two years. Um, is intervention really just a bearing surface? Don't we have more things in uh, making a lot of effects here? And meanwhile, uh, Ashley was publishing this uh, paper uh, analysis from the National Joint Registry that showed that metal, on, metal implants, which were a lot more expensive than the traditional metal and plastic ones. If you see, um, they were about 1500, but the traditional ones were about 750 pounds. And uh, it showed that they were failing at a much higher rate. And with that came this idea of, okay, we're, uh, the surgeons are stopping doing the metal on metal implants and they were going to substitute them, not by the cheaper ones, but with ones that are, were even more expensive, costing two and 3,000 pounds. So I kept saying to Ashley, I don't think the review is going to go very far. We need more than this. We need to look at costs and we, perhaps we need uh, something more like an economic model to actually answer this question, not just, um, not just um, a review. And meanwhile, I was working at the research design service as a consultant. I had uh, experience writing a few grants. I had been co-op on a few RFPBs. I was very comfortable with the funding scheme and I was writing grants for the clinicians that come to me. And I was thinking if I'm writing the grants for them, why can't I write one for myself? And um, I started to understand how clinicians see things and uh, what are the priorities for them versus mine. And um, I understood that a lot of the questions that clinicians came to us was, were economic in, in nature, so were about how to make this um, service more efficient, how to make this technology more efficient. Um, it was all about uh, costs to the NHS. They, they, those things were very uh, up in their head as well. And they, they, their solution for everything was a trial because clinicians only trusted trials. And I started thinking, actually, sometimes we don't need a trial and you can actually get to the final answer that will help uh, implementation of findings without a big expensive trial that needs to run for years. Um, maybe that there's uh, other ways to do that, make it a more efficient research. And we're talking about 2009, 2010, cooking this idea. And in 2012, I was ready to actually uh, develop it. And I was trying to find what would be the right funding scheme. And most of health economists as PIs at the time were writing fellowships um, and they were doing all the work. And I was like, the fellowship felt too much like a PhD again. I did not want to go down that route. And there was a lot of work in, in the, the thing that I was thinking of that I didn't want to do myself. I wanted to, 
to, to do more of the economic modeling work, not so much the, the review work anymore. So I was thinking maybe what I want is a grant, um, not a fellowship. And then I started wondering about funding schemes, MRC and IHR. And uh, MRC were more about methods development. And I, I, my, I saw my research question very much as applied research to, for patient benefit. And I thought, I want to go in IHR. And, and then, you know, I think size matters, especially as, as PIs and junior researchers. We should start small um, with schemes like RFPB um, that are more lenient to our junior PIs and build our experience to fit challenges later. And um, I think at the time, RFPBs had very few uh, rare uh, economists as PIs. I only knew one, and he was a PI of a trial. He was not PI of uh, observational methodology studied like I was designing. So um, it, it raised a few eyebrows. I run these questions past the RDS. And there was another health economist in the RDS that uh, said, actually, this is brilliant value for money for a funder. You're avoiding huge expensive trial and getting to uh, uh, um, an answer. And it was his confidence in me that I could do it that actually led me to, to put this uh, forward. And um, I thought, yeah, maybe I can do it, even though some, some other colleagues were, you know, I'm not entirely sure if RFPV will go for it. And now, um, you know, 10 years later, we know that they will. So the most important thing after that was building a team and having clinicians that were happy to delegate to a junior person um, being the lead on a grant. And you need to find a helpful clinician in that. Sometimes um, the RDS and other groups can help you find the clinicians that will advise you and not want to take over as well. Um, it's very important to have that kind of support. And then another thing that I uh, thought was I want to to build a relationship with the methodologies that I want to work with. I wanted to learn about this certain modeling methodology. So I, I approached them. I said, can I start going to your seminars? Can I start joining your group? Can I join your mailing lists? I want to learn about what you do. Um, and, and they were very kind, uh, very generous with their time. Um, and uh, they, they actually sat with me. Um, talked me through what I wanted to do and told me this can be done, this cannot be done, um, and uh, helped me structure exactly my research question and my plan. Um, the other thing was the PPI and the stakeholders. You know, these things need planning in advance. Um, and I think more than PPI, especially for economists, we need to think about just not just the patients, but the stakeholders at hand. So we're looking at the um, um, looking at, um, so for example, uh, how to implement this, putting surgeons and, and, and clinicians and other hospital management um, on board with the results that we are going to work on. Um, and the final um, was looking at collaborators. I was going to need data from registries. And the UK registry at the time had, was a bit short term. It only have about 10, 11 years follow up. And I needed to know things into 20, 30, 40 years down the line. So I teamed up with Sweden uh, registry um, to engage, uh, try to find the right people and, and bring them on board saying, if we need you, will you analyze this data for us and give us estimates for the model? And, and they said yes, which was a um, huge relief. Then went on to write the grant. Um, what I understood is that methodology needs to be spot on uh, and needs to be interesting to the methodologists that are working with you. So I was a junior person and I was the most junior person of the of, of the whole co-applicants. So I had professors there um, whose my grant was just a tiny little bit of, of their day. They, they, um, I need to make it interesting for them to want to be um, co-applicants on my grant. Uh, I did a lot of preparation work. I, um, the other thing that I learned, you have to help them help you. So if you want uh, the surgeons to go and uh, talk to the Swedish people that you want to work with, um, I wrote the emails for them. I found their email addresses. I wrote everything, gave them an email, say, please copy paste this uh, and send it from, from your email. And maybe they'll listen to you more than you know, me, uh, a junior um, foreign girl from 
whatever. So, you know, I did, I did all that work to help them help me because um, it was my baby, not theirs. Um, writing the grant, uh, you also need to understand that every box matters to someone. Um, you know, and being on a, on a funding panel now, I, I will look at the methods, for example, but there will be somebody else looking at PPI and there will be somebody else looking at engagement and dissemination and things that to me are not so important, but for the others are. Um, and finally, uh, build time for your details. They take forever to format. I remember when I was submitting the grant the day before, one of the co-applicants still didn't have their profile on, on the website. Back then, you had to make your profile, put your all your um, all your publications. She had 120 publications, and she sent me a PDF CV. Um, and I remember crying, <laughs> building her her profile with 120 publications manually imputed there. But you know, it doesn't matter. It was time well spent because I put it there, uh, it was done. She was my, my, my co-applicant and she did brilliant work. And I, I'm so happy that she took the time to do it, but it does take forever to, to do those details, think about it. Um, so I submitted uh, January, 2013 and in July I got the result. And it was, no, I got rejected. After all that work, um, I spent my Christmas holiday working until 2 and 3 a.m. Um, I, I thought of every detail. I, I worked on it for about six months and I was so gutted. I cried. <laughs> I cried. And I'll tell you one thing. Um, if your boss has got a problem with your crying, change your boss because um, it's okay to have failures. Uh, you pick yourself off the ground and you you go on and I looked at the feedback the feedback was actually amazing uh, all the external reviewers really liked it the panel didn't at all uh, have problems with everything so I tried to um, account for what the panel had said um, and I stick to my guns when I felt I was very strongly I was in the know more than they did and I let go of some other things to to make it more uh, appealing for everybody and I submitted it again and holding below, you know, I, I couldn't believe it when I got the news um, back in 2014 early um, and I uh, and I got funded and I was I couldn't believe that I got funded. And amazingly, the panel had very few comments and got me funded with probably one of the highest rates of that day uh, scores. Uh, and the peer reviewers were horrendous. They hated the, the external peer reviewers hated my grant. So um, I don't know, uh, you know, it's about what happens on the day. Maybe they felt sorry for me that the peer reviews were so bad. I have no idea, but you know, this is a human process that you are going to go through and you're writing to a panel. Um, you're making your business case uh, of why you think your research is important. And it just happens that you, that I was successful this time. So, um, you know, what I'd say is stick to your guns and try again uh, if you fail the first time. So leading the HIPS team uh, was actually quite amazing. I got 240K of funding. It was um, started with a network meta-analysis comparing 24 different implants or 33 different implants. And then 24 of them were used in an economic model um, compared uh, between them to uh, establish the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness combined uh, data from two registries uh, over 1 million individual patient data were analyzed with um, 30 years follow up. And the good thing about this was that it did encourage other colleagues of mine who were also very junior health economists to apply for grants as PI using uh, this kind of idea. So. Um, health economics methods to change practice directly instead of going through um, trials, uh, sometimes using, using data to efficiently answer um, a, research, a health research question that is important. So it turned out that it became an NHS sex uh, story and they did a case study and put a little profile of me. It was really nice. We got a signal in the NIHR and the BMJ editorial about uh, uh, the results of our study. We've got two four-star ref publications um, and um, that I, I never imagined it, it was going to, to be this, this good. And 
the results were very clear um, of what was the best and most cost effective implant for the older patients. Um, and um, nice got in touch about how are we going to change the, the guidelines, uh, guidelines according to this. And um, we decided, we, we thought about how to, to do it in the future. And it was also very clear that for the younger patients, the evidence is not strong enough to make any recommendations. And we already exhausted methodologically how to analyze this data to get any sensible answer out of there. So we know that now, um, the only way to answer this question is going to be with a massive trial. Uh, and we now have the justification for why we need this massive trial. We have already exhausted methodologically everything that we can do with the data that we have. So we are actually designing the trial that we thought it was impossible. It's, um, it's powered at uh, 10 years revision rates. Um, it's got more than 8,000 patients uh, to be randomized between different implants. And it's just been uh, through stage one of program grant now. Um, and we got shortlisted for uh, stage two, which I thought was almost going to be mission impossible, uh, that they would never go for um, a trial with a 10 year um, uh, outcome, um, but they went for it. And um, so fingers crossed for stage two, I'll let you know if it gets funded. Um, and uh, the other thing is that we also had a new RFPB uh, using similar uh, methodology now for knees and not hips. And we are improving on the methods that we use for hips to make it even stronger uh, methodological study. So we kind of um, went well from there. Um, so lessons I learned is that people won't care about this study, not as much as you do. And that's absolutely okay, you know? Um, that's not a problem. Um, learn to engage the people whose interests are not yours, uh, you know, um, make it interesting to all. Uh, why do professors want to come to your meetings? What is in it for the junior researchers and all the stakeholders and the collaborators and the PPI and the lay people? And uh, try to make it, uh, try to make them um, uh, worth their value and their time. Uh, for example, I remember when I invited lay people to my, my meetings, um, they were going to listen about Markov models, uh, network meta-analysis, um, what is consistency, you know, all these technical terms. And so I invited them and I asked them to arrive half an hour, 45 minutes earlier, um, actually an hour. I gave them coffee and biscuits. And I talk them through and say, what you're going to listen about is going to be all of these things that are going to happen. And these are the models. And what we want to discuss in the, between us the, the, is this, 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 and the other. You can help us by giving your input when we're talking about X, Y, and Z. And they were so helpful for having that time of me talking through what the meeting was going to go, uh, what, what the meeting was going to be about before they actually experienced it. So the other thing I learned is what makes a successful manager. And it, it's not about just delivering to time and budget. And it's about building relationships and making people want to work with you, not just for this grant, but uh, for the grants and the, the future work as well. So if you're going to micromanage everything and um, be on top of everybody all the time, they might not want to work with you afterwards. You know, uh, So you have to give them some leeway, understand that people are going through their own agendas and their own issues, and you have to work with them. And it's OK that you have to wait three, four weeks for something that you wanted right now. If it makes the other person happier in their post and actually going to give you something useful in four weeks instead of something completely rubbish in two. Um, so, uh, you know, Roll with the punches, you know, shit happens, um, uh, you know, wait, um, expect the unexpected. The funder is your, is your uh, ally. Uh, what they want ultimately is to have a, a funding scheme that is successful. Um, get things in writing and file it. And I'll, I'll give an example of uh, the NJR data that I called them on the phone and I said, this is the project that I'm uh, working on. Uh, can I have... Uh, how would the data work for you? Uh, can I have your data? And they said, uh, yes. Um, I sent back an email and saying, I just to confirm that you said you were going to give us the data, blah, 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 blah. And then when the thing got funded, I got back to them again and 
said, how about the data? And they said, um, well, um, we changed our methods of um, allowing, and now you have to put in um, um, an application for it. I put in an application and they rejected it. So I was like, crazy how can they reject after they said yes and i went back to my emails and the university had had a, a server a server out um and i lost all the emails so i didn't have it in writing that they said they would give me the data so you know uh, it, things happened you um you roll with it uh you make it work um file it when you got things in writing, file it somewhere uh, so you have it in, um, and you can get back to it later. Um, the other thing is uh, chocolate biscuits really makes people want to go to your meetings. Um, you know, give them some food. Um, there was once that I um, ordered pizza uh, for lunch. You know, um, and you know, um, don't pay lip service. Show people you value their input, and um, and dissemination of your results is more important than anything else. Okay, um, last, last thing I'd like to say is that um, RDS can really help you find your force. Um, you know, uh, grant writing is a skill, is about writing to a panel and make the panel engage with you. Uh, the RDS experts, they all have their quirkinesses, uh, but they are really generous people with their time. They'll help you build your team. They help you with all these little things that you have no idea that you need to sort of think of when you're writing a grant, but you will need to think of them. And they'll know all of this. They have the knowledge of the funding schemes in and out. Um, and they are they are there for you. And that is all for me. I, I hope that um, this was interesting and engaging in some way. If there's any way I can help any junior people uh, think their uh, ideas through, I'll be very happy to talk to them. Thanks, Julian. Thank you so much, Elsa. And um, it's lovely.